Professor uh, Christina Rivers from DePaul University. She's a professor of po political science, uh, and her specialty is on African American topics, as well as I believe you're teaching a uh, thing on civil rights. I do some civil rights law. So civil rights law as well. So, and uh, she's been um, kind enough to give us the the historical backdrop of what we're going to be talking about today, which is the the two uh, the two folks that I mentioned earlier. So it's an open format in terms of Q and A. Uh, what I'd like her to do at first is sort of set the stage because I think that you, if you think about these two uh, black icons of, of history, uh, W.E.B. Du Bois and uh, uh, Booker T. Washington, you can sort of see parallels throughout history uh, in the 60s, who were the sort of those opposing views, if you will, and, and these two were, were obviously at odds quite, quite a bit of, of their history, and obviously how that applies today. So. What, I, what I'd like her to do is sort of develop these two gentlemen individually, sort of talk about the, the politics of the time and how they were sort of uh, battling it out, if you will, for the different ideologies around black politics. And then obviously we, we will open it up for Q&A. But if you have questions, by all means, we want you to participate. So please do. And uh, again, welcome. And um, I'll let Dr. Rivers take over. Thank you very much. Can everyone hear me? My students never give me applause. This is great. I'll just stay here. Unless I leave the, the room, then they give me a standing ovation. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much for inviting me to give this talk. Um, I, I love this topic. I teach a course on um, foundations of black political thought starting at 1830, and it's one of my all-time favorite classes. And so to be able to talk about parts of that again and to get away from DePaul for a couple of days to do so is a real treat. Um, to do this and to have this talk in the land of John Brown and the Jayhawkers is even more of a treat. And that could be for a whole other topic, but it, it's a, a double honor to be here under these circumstances. Um, I was asked to talk roughly about um, this notion of black conservatism, black liberalism, the debates between black conservatives and black liberals, um, and how it informs the context of today's ideological debates between African or among African Americans, and to use your turn to provide a backdrop. And of course, for every backdrop, there's a backdrop. So just for a couple of seconds, I want to give a brief backdrop on uh, the predecessors to Du Bois and Booker T. Washington. I'm just going to take a couple of times to do this. But there were several ideological debates going on among African American leaders well before these two individuals, not to take away from them at all. Um, but in the antebellum era, of course, the major debate amongst black leaders was about slavery, and most agreed they wanted to get rid of it. But there were huge debates about how to go about doing this. Uh, did one pursue abolition in a very uh, militant way, or did one pursue abolition through this notion of moral suasion, for which Frederick Douglass is most known? So that's one debate. Um, during the Reconstruction era, you had debates over how to best make use of one's civil rights. Um, should one push for the right to vote and to really take best advantage of that? Should one push for economic rights? So these were all debates that preceded Booker T. Washington's era. And then you get into the redemption era when the right to vote was slowly began to be shut down for African Americans after a really vibrant moment of political engagement on the part of African Americans during the Reconstruction era. And it, during the Reconstruction, of course, you had 22 or so blacks who were elected to uh, the House of Representatives, you had two black senators, and you had blacks who were being elected at all levels of local and state government in the former Confederate South. But as that curtain started to drop on black suffrage, the debate uh, became, well, what do we do with our civil rights that we do have? Should we push for them further, and how do we do so? And so that's a really quick thumbnail backdrop into these debates between um, W.E.B. Du Bois and Booker T. Washington. Um, another thing I wanted to add before I got any further on this talk is that it's always a little tricky, at least for me, um, to talk about folks whether they're conservative or whether they're liberal because I tend to look at things very literally. And so I'm not sure it also can be applied to African Americans as easily as we would like to think it is. And so I'm going to suggest some different terms to think about. Um, when I think about these thinkers and what they were pushing for and the way they pushed for it, um, I think of conservatism as almost analogous to conformist. And I'll tell you why I think that in a minute. 
um, I think of liberal as almost more analogous to radical. Now, radical can go either way. You can be radically conservative or you can be radically liberal. I'm just thinking of the term radical in terms of really pushing to pull out a problem by its root, not to cut it off as it's at its head. I'm a gardener, so when I get the dandelion, I don't just snatch it out. You gotta get that fork and just really dig it up, and then you pull up this long root that's as long as the flower. So these are the terms that I tend to use um, more when I'm thinking about ideological differences between African American leaders. Now another term that I'm, you'll hear me using quite a bit here um, is accommodationism. Another an analogy for conservatism when we're talking about Booker T. Washington is the accommodation of Jim Crow segregation. That's a term that is directly applied to him that he is directly associated with. It's almost analogous. If you see a picture of Booker, Booker T. Washington, the term accommodationist comes to mind. He never used the term. This is a term that historians have applied to him since then. So what they're talking about is his accommodation of Jim Crow segregation as it existed at that point. That's a misleading term, as I hope to demonstrate to you, but for the time being, I'm sort of thinking about debates between accommodating the status quo and challenging it um, in a more radical way through integration, which was Du Bois's goal. So does anybody have any questions on what I just threw out there? Because I, I know that was kind of fast. Um, okay, as I said, Booker T. Washington is most known for his accommodation of Jim Crow segregation. How many of you have read anything by Booker T. Washington at all? The Atlanta Compromise speech, a couple people there. Okay, that's really what he's most known for. And I don't profess to have read everything that these people have written, by the way. Du Bois wrote prolifically for seven decades. So I defy anyone to tell me that they've written everything that he's written. And of course, over the course of second, seven decades, he changed his mind an awful lot. Um, but du Booker T. Washington is most known for endorsing this politics of accommodationism and in his speech to Atlanta, this, these were Atlanta civic leaders, white civic leaders and political leaders. He uh, expressed the uh, notion that African Americans and whites were like the five separate fingers of the same hand. They don't, they're not knotted together, it's not like they're webbed, but you need ideally all five fingers on that hand to really function. And so this is how he envisioned the way the two races would get along. Not necessarily interlocked, but one needs the other to function. And so what he was really doing was appealing to white leaders to allow the races to work together in that way. He was also appealing to African Americans, to use his terms, cast their buckets down where they were. In other words, stay in the South. Do not all leave and, and, and join this mass exodus that was already beginning in, in terms of moving up North, where at least there were fuller civil rights. In his view, if you cast your buckets down where you were um, and you pursued economic advantagement and were good citizens, that over time, African Americans could prove their worth to white power holders in the South. And over time, they would be seen as worthy of getting things granted to them like, or regranted, like their voting rights and like full civil rights. So he has often been mistaken as endorsing segregation and Jim Crow as something that was perfectly fine. That's actually not the case. And that's not doing him much credit to characterize him in that way. Now, if you fast forward to the 60s, um, a, a common term for somebody who followed Booker T. Washington was you're a Bookerite. And those were fighting words by the 60s, especially by the late 60s during the Black Power Movement, because that meant you were an Uncle Tom, you were a sellout. Um, but that's really not what Booker T. Washington was getting at. What he was getting at was a very incremental approach to getting full civil rights in a way that was safe in the South in an era in which uh, physical intimidation and violence had peaked, um, and in a way that was least destabilizing. And in a way in which he viewed where blacks could succeed with some modicum of dignity. Would it be uh, safe to say that that was sort of the Martin Luther King approach at the time? Well, you know, it's ironic. He probably would have been a Bookerite because most middle class blacks and elite blacks in the South were Bookerites. Now that's not to say you didn't have follower, followers of Du Bois in the South because you had NAACP, NAACP branches throughout. But some would argue that Martin Luther King was too incrementalist in his own approach and they would have described him as a Bookerite in a rather insulting way. 
People like Malcolm X would have said that. Right. Stop asking. Just demand your rights. Take your rights. Others would argue that Martin Luther King was too radical because he was pushing too quickly for integration, a la W.E.B. Du Bois. So it depends on who was looking at him. White segregationists would say, why so fast? There's no accident that the title of his most well-known book is Why We Can't Wait, that he put out in 1963. Yes? How much of this... Uh How much of that, though, was, was predicated on the, on the attempt to eliminate countervailing voices to the feudal socialistic liberal elements in, in the civil rights movement? In other words, if I, if, if I call it, and we see the same thing today in, in politics like with the Tea Party movements, where they make up fabrications are put out about somebody and that makes it so that you can't oh well I don't want to associate I, with I get it okay so I, I think um, just real briefly because I do want to continue this uh, setting the the stage for this but I believe you're right in a sense that a voice was if you look at the movement in the 60s and I, I call it the say it loud I'm black and I'm proud movement right it was meant to say okay enough of this waiting if you will, we're going to start demanding our rights. And for those who don't want to follow that plan, you are going to be labeled an Uncle Tom. You're going to be labeled a sellout and so on and so forth. So I agree with you. There was probably that. I don't know if, if you've got a commentary on it as well. but for, for when these accusations were made in the 60s or during the turn of the century or now? I think he's saying during the 60s. During the 60s. Um, you know, it's hard to say during the 60s because, again. Because you weren't born then, right? You're so kind. <laughs> a lady never tells. Um, <laughs> I'm literally a child of the 60s. So I was you know, watching this as I was watching the Flintstones. I wasn't paying attention to it very carefully. And I was in Southern California, and not a whole lot was going on in San Diego in the 60s. Um, I think by the time these terms, Uncle Tom, were flung out during the Black Power, Say It Loud, I'm Black and I'm Proud movement. That was really an unprecedented era of black cultural pride. Now, it's for another class for me to talk about the various waves of what we call black nationalism. There's political nationalism. There's economic nationalism. There's religious nationalism. There's emigrationism. Through all those different waves, you can take this all the way back to the 1830s, even prior to that, no one embraced this notion of black cultural nationalism until the late 60s. And so it was saying a whole lot more when they were talking about this Uncle Tomism. This boiled down not only to what you said, but how you looked and how, how you looked, what that said about you, for better or for worse. So it was really the sort of unprecedented era of cultural embrace of one's African roots that had never really happened before. 